So from 25 to 36, I literally had a life of just partying and alcohol. And I'm drinking because I'm still trying to shut these thoughts of what happened to me as a kid, as a teenager. Again, I'm finding myself, okay, where, who do I identify as? Who am I? When I went into the church, I don't know if you guys ever heard this song called Come to the Altar. There's a lyric that said, are you overwhelmed by your sin? And God, literally, the Lord showed me everything that I did against him. Not in a way to condemn me, but in a way like in love. And I'm sitting here like, I don't know, God, I don't know about this because I have so much shame. The next thing he said to me, he says, I see a wall stacked up way out high, like a brick wall. There's a door, there's a key with my friend, Jesus and I, with his help. We're gonna open the door, sit on the couch, assess the whole situation, and one by one, that brick wall is gonna come down. So I actually grew up in a small town in Guatemala. It's called Tikisate. And I grew up uh, with my grandmother, with uh, five other siblings. I'm actually a twin. And we grew up, with, from what I remember, was Catholic. So it wasn't really a like a religious home. We just went to church. We just went to mass, and that was about it. I didn't really have a relationship with God. Uh, I was just going to church, but at... Uh, Five years old, actually, so this is where my st story starts. It's when I finally met my parents. I grew up with my grandmother, and at five years old, I met my dad. He came over to Guatemala just to come get us because we were moving to Virginia. And um, when I first met him, my grandmother already built stories about him telling me that he, you know, he was going to bring gifts. So what children, what kids don't like gifts, right? So he came bearing gifts like Santa Claus and we were all excited. And uh, that day, I remember during the day, it was just a joyful time getting to know my dad because I've never met him. And uh, unfortunately, that night, it took a turn. Uh, it was an unexpected turn. We went to sleep like regular, and I woke up with my dad being at the edge of my bed, uh, touching me inappropriately. I didn't know what to expect. I was, my body froze. I was, my small body, my small frame just froze. I didn't know what to expect, and I just said, okay. Uh, I was really confused. So the next day, I found myself putting a lot of clothes over my body because I just was confused on what just happened the night before. And I lived in a place where it was 90 degrees. It was like 100, 90 to 100 degrees. And I felt, why am I putting so many clothes over my mind, um, over, my, over my body? So immediately I went from thinking like a child to thinking like an adult. So that whole day, I just, you know, it was hot. And I just walked around in a lot of clothes because I didn't want my dad to see me how he saw him, how he, what he did the night prior. So eventually, uh, we moved to Virginia. We moved to Alexandria, Virginia. And um, I went from going to a Catholic church to a Pentecostal church. So we grew up uh, Pentecostal, Pentecostal, I'm so sorry, Pentecostal from five to 12 years old. When we got there, my dad actually was really big on sharing his t testimony on how he came to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so was my mom. So I saw my mom in the worship team and my dad preaching at the altar when I was a kid. But every night my dad would come into the room and he would, you know, molest me every, it wasn't like once or twice a week. It was literally like every night. Wow. So I'm going to church and I'm thinking, okay, we're talking about Jesus and we're talking about the love of Christ. But yet I feel like, there's hell in my house, you know? So I started to feel as if, how do I worship a God or how do I get to know Jesus if this is happening in our house? So there came a point where when we moved to our home in Virginia that we had to share a bed with, I have four other sis, three other sisters and we had to share a bed and the bed was against the wall. And I remember thinking, okay, my sisters and I were all fighting over the, the outside of the bed. Why are we fighting to be on the outside of the bed? So the outside of the bed meant, okay, that's the person that's going to get touched that night. You know, so I finally just said, you know what? I don't want to fight with my sisters anymore. And it almost felt like at six years old, I have to sacrifice myself because I don't want to fight anymore. And I just, I'll take whatever my dad's going to do to us that night. So for from about six years old to nine years old, that was ongoing until we got bunk beds. But, you know, at the age of eight, I remember 
I was trying to tell my mom what happened. And, uh, you know, my grandmother actually caught my dad doing that to my older sibling. And, you know, my mom just couldn't believe what was going on. I believe she knew what was going on, but she just couldn't believe it. So I thought we were going to be free that weekend because my dad left because my grandmother called the police and uh, essentially wanted him to be out the house because here's my grandmother who raised all six children and finding out what my dad was doing. So I thought we were going to be free that weekend. But eventually, you know, my mom forgave my dad. And when he came back um, into the house, you know, the molestation turned into like groping, harder, you know, abuse sexually, and then also now physically. And my dad had this thing where he would line all my brothers and sisters up together. And just if any of us just did anything wrong, he would literally just one by one just kind of like hit us. Wow. You know? So I remember growing up in a home where it was just a lot of sexual abuse, a lot of physical abuse. And by the time we were 12 years old, by the time I was 12 years old, uh, we stopped going to the church. My dad actually went from molesting me to now trying to penetrate me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was really hard for me because I'm going to middle school, I'm starting school, and, you know, all my friends are talking about boys, and I'm just like, okay— it was hard at that time for me to just kind of differentiate, like, what, who do I listen to? Or, well, this is happening to me at my house. So by the time I was uh, 14 years old, my dad actually, you know, full on raped me. And I actually got pregnant by him. Wow. And he uh, forced me to get an abortion at 14. And literally, when I try to go tell my mom this happened to me, um, she said, well, maybe if you didn't, wouldn't dress provocatively. And this is the 90s, and I'm wearing, like, really big clothes because the 90s was, like, a really big clothes. And she said, if you wouldn't, you know, dress like that, or maybe you wouldn't provoke him. So mm-hmm. I, um, the whole abortion was uh, a secret. When I told my dad that I got pregnant, he told me you probably got pregnant by a boy. And a lot of that was, like... How would you say that, you know, that's something that you did, you know? So by the time I was 15, my parents were like, you know what? We don't want to um, deal with you guys, which is my twin sister and my older sister. So they actually left us and my older sister and I became homeless. And yeah. it was just us three living in a, in a hotel, motel, actually. So for the better part of like 15 till about... 25 years old it was me just getting heavy into drugs now alicia before we move on to that part Mm -hmm. i i want to bring it back a little bit to uh, the abortion yeah 14 years old yeah this is done to you by somebody that's supposed to you know be protecting you yeah two traumatic incidents happening at once yeah um can you just kind of take us through that very quickly and the only reason i ask is because there's other people, obviously, that are going through that. But when it came to the abortion, mm-hmm. what were you thinking in that time? What what was that like for you, for people who don't even know what that, you know, it's like at 14 years old? Uh, you know, I had such, from the first time that happened to me at five years old to that time, I had so much anger built up in me that in that time, I just suppressed it. I didn't really want to talk about it because it it made it it was made to be as if it was shameful like it was my fault that I did it you know I provoked him and I made it happen so at the abortion even on the table that I was when well, this was happening uh, the ladies around me were like this is your fault too so everybody wow. was just pointing it at me and be like well maybe if you wouldn't have slept with that boy. This wouldn't have been happening. So this is what they told you, like the doctors were the, telling you The this? nurses around me, wow. you know, and they were t- even before the process that I was in the room, they were trying to convince me not to get it. But me, I didn't want to do it. I wanted to have the baby. I said, maybe this is the love that I can have that has never been shown to me. Because like you said, the person that was supposed to protect me never protected me. Instead, he saw me in a different way. Right. So for me... At that time, at 14 years old, I suppressed all of that. It was more of me building up more anger and just suppressing everything because even from five 
to at that time when I even try to say it many times to my mom or my grandma or my sisters, it was more like, we don't talk about this. Right. You need to shut it down. So even when I got to that point, I just suppressed everything, yeah. you know, and I became even more angry and even more depressed mm. because now I'm just like, okay, I guess I don't want to share this. And I guess I'm just going to, this is another thing that I have to go through. You know, because this is something that was put on me and I was forced into it just like I was forced when I was starting at five years old. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And talk to us about the the after, right? That anger. And you started to mention about some of the things that begin to happen after. So after that happens, where did your life go from there? So after that, um, my parents left us when we were 15. Um, it was just my twin sister and my other sister. My older brothers and sisters, they left the house already. So it was just us. After that, they left. We lived in motels because here I am 15, going on 16. My sister's about to be 18, and we're trying to figure out where to live. So when my parents left us, it was almost like a freedom for me mm -hmm. because I we were under our dad's, like, you know, it was like a prison for us, you know, and living in that house. So now I'm free. Now I'm free to do whatever I want to do. And the abortion just went behind my head. Like it wasn't even, it didn't even happen, you know, just like suppressed everything. Like I suppressed everything since I was a kid. And I started, I got introduced to drugs actually by some friends in high school. And uh, I started hanging around with these two girls and they started introducing me to uh, ecstasy you know, all types of form of ecstasy that had heroin, acid, um, cocaine, and it was laced with everything. And I needed a drug to just shut the demons that were in my mind because of that anger that I was starting to build up. They essentially said to me, if you do this drug, it's going to take you to a trance, into a place where you're just going to be feeling really good and nothing, you're not going to think about anything. So when I went into that trance, I actually took the anger with me. And I never let anybody touch me. You know, when you're like on ecstasy, people are like touching you. You're, I was just like, leave me alone. I was an angry person. I'm like, I just want to be in this corner by myself. I started drinking as well. So from like five, tw 15 literally to 25, I was trying to s see where who I was. Who am I? Am I this person that drinks? Am I this person that does drugs? Or am I this person also because I tried on many different religions. I tried a Mormon. I tried being a Muslim. I tried even when I was 25 years old, I was starting Santeria. I, I was trying to find who I was in the drugs and then who I was in the religions that people kept introducing me to. Yeah. So I knew that I grew up Pentecostal and I knew that I had the fear of God, like not a reverence fear, but like a fear of I'm scared because people from the church would say, if you do this, you're going to go to hell. No, nothing to Pentecostal people, but everything was, you're going to go to hell. And I was just like, oh my God, I can't even watch a Disney movie. You're going to go to hell. Okay, as a kid, it's like, you're going to hell. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, so I had that fear. So I would dabble in like certain drugs, but I wouldn't like snort cocaine or I wouldn't shoot anything up my arm. I would literally just put it in a pill. I was safe. I was good. So at 25 years old, after trying being a Mormon, being, um, you know, Catholic again, being a Muslim, I got introduced to a friend who told me that her mom was a witch. And she's like, hey, there's like this um, shop up the street. I think we should go check it out together. I heard this lady reads your shell. She tells you your future. And I'm sitting here like, oh, OK. And I remember going back as a kid in the Pentecostal church, they would literally play videos on like voodoo doctors and witches and how the believers will go in and like pretty much uh take those demons out deliver those people that were doing those practices so i came across it and the lady i went into the shop and the lady said okay i'm gonna she gave me the whole process i'm gonna read your shells i'm gonna tell you and you tell me if you agree with anything that you know happened in your life so she literally told me everything that happened in my life wow. and i'm sitting here like confused because I know the church told me if you ever come across it, you know, call out to the name of Jesus and then he'll come and save you and you won't do it. But I'm sitting here curious, like, okay, um, let me see what she has to say. And she told me everything, even to the point where how I got molested and what happened to me with my family and stuff like that. So here I am and she's telling me all of this. And she said, I think the next step that we want to do is I want to like baptize you. 
you know, into the Santeria and this is what we have to do. So I said, okay, I agreed because I've been searching for so long and I, I can never find it anywhere. Now that I'm a believer, the Lord would be like, I'm not there. He would literally tell me I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm in, I'm not in Mormonism. I'm not in Catholics. I'm not in Pentecostal. I'm not there. And then when I went to the Santeria, literally I found myself in this like tub where the lady cut a um, chicken's head off in front of me with a sword. And she had like a shrine of swords with a bunch of chicken heads there. And she said, this is what we're going to do with your baptism. And she starts, uh, you know, spitting the blood on me. And then she starts hitting me with this, um, some form of grass. And then uh, she's then after that spitting, it was like a ritual. So then she was spitting um, smoke at me from a cigar. The whole time she's doing this to me, I'm praying. Because I remember the church said, anytime you're in a situation, call out to the name of Jesus. So I'm praying the entire time. And I'm just asking God, I'm saying, God, forgive me. You know, like, I don't know why I'm here. Like, why am I here? Forgive me, please. So I left and I said, okay, that was an odd experience. And I went home and I fell asleep. And before I walked into the shop, there was some statues there. Apparently, like if you put money to a statue, it could be like for wealth or it could be for love or it could be for anything. You put money on the statue, those statues are supposedly, they'll give you whatever you want. Right. So that night when I went to sleep, those statues actually came to me in my dream. It's almost like they were alive and mm. they came around me and they were sniffing me and they were asking me, who are you? Who sent you? And I'm sitting here like, I'm so scared because I don't know who they are. And obviously now I know they're demons. They're wanting to know who I am and why I'm praying in this place. So I woke up because I was like super scared. I'm like, oh, I don't want to mess with any of the demonic. You know, I grew up hearing about it. I don't want to mess with it. So that was when I was 25 years old. So after that, I just said, you know what? I'm not going to mess with anything, no religion. I'm just going to be free and do whatever I want to do. And at that time, the, the whole new age started to come about. And I got introduced to that. I got introduced to crystals as well. And this is a time where I moved to Miami. So in Miami, you know, 25 years old, not really knowing anybody. I moved by myself. Um, and it reminded me of my country. You know, it was a tropical area. So that's the reason why I moved there. So from 25 to 36, I literally had a life of just partying and alcohol. And I would drink occasional wine at first, but then the wine became two big bottles of wine every night to then now hard liquor to then now I would just drink the liquor like it was water. And I'm drinking because I'm still trying to shut these thoughts of what happened to me as a kid, as a teenager, and how many people just have rejected me in my whole life. And even every religion I try to get into or try to dabble in, it was just rejection. Again, I'm finding myself, okay, where, who do I identify as? Who am I? I'm now identifying myself in this, in the bottle, in the alcohol. And first it was wine and now it's hard liquor, like brown whiskey liquor, mm -hmm. drinking it like it was water. March 2016, one of my girlfriends actually from Virginia that we went to middle school with, she came up and she was like, uh, I was the person that if you visited me in Miami, I was the party girl. Like I would show you a good time. We will be out to like 9, 10, 11 o'clock, I mean in the morning. Literally. And wow. I was the person who showed you a good time. So she came and she saw my lifestyle and she said, oh, no, girl, you better get right with Jesus. And I'm like, oh, I don't know about your Jesus. You know, I'm OK. I'm cool. I'm OK without, you know, without Jesus. I heard about him. She took me to a church, uh, her church. It was Calvary in Plantation, Florida. And uh, she said, just come with me to church. It was Easter Sunday. You know, everybody invites everybody Easter Sunday, right? <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll go check it out. Even that was a process. So when I went into the church, I don't know if you guys ever heard this song called Come to the Altar. And, and the, there's a lyric that said, are you overwhelmed by your sin? And God literally, the Lord showed me everything it was like a, a slide. Everything that I did against him, not in a way to condemn me, but in a way like in love. My friend would tell you I was shaking like a leaf. Like I couldn't even look up to the altar. I couldn't look up to the preacher. I'm literally like with my head down, 
that entire time looking at the Bible because they gave you a Bible and a flyer about Easter Sunday and what was going to happen. And I'm sitting here like, I don't know, God, I don't know about this because I have so much shame. We're talking about drugs, alcohol. We're talking about abortions that I had even after that abortion that happened with my dad. You know, I got into a relationship with a guy for a long time and we had abortions even in that relationship, you know, so everything just came forth and I was overwhelmed and I just started crying. And of course, you know, my friend that's a believer, she's like, she's going to come to Christ today. And I'm just like so overwhelmed by my shame. They did an altar call and I didn't go up because I was so ashamed of what I did against God. So I got home that day and I said, okay, God, all right, I'm going to do this, uh, uh, but take the bottle away from me. I'll do this. I'll just go to work and I'll go home, but take the bottle away from me. Now, uh, Alicia, very quick, out of uh, all things, why the bottle? Because that was my go-to thing. Mm. Literally, anytime I had a thought, I dropped the drugs. Because earlier in my 20s, I got into a car accident where everybody was like around me. We were doing drugs and God saved me from that. So I dropped the drugs through that. But the bottle is what I would go to. It was my go-to thing anytime I had a thought of what my dad did or what happened to me. Uh, I, that's just, well, that was my go-to, mm. literally. So I asked him, I said, just take this bottle away from me. So from March to December, I literally did not go out. I mean, I would go out every day till like we in the morning. How I kept the job, I have no idea. It was the, by the grace of God because I literally would go to work drunk. When there was happy hour, I would go to happy hour. I lived in South Beach where there was a bar all around me. You know, so it's temptation all around me, and I didn't care. I would just go two o'clock, happy hour, I'm right there, and then I'll just 30 minutes, I'll go back to work, put a breath mint in my mouth, some gum, and I know my coworkers smelled my alcohol, but by the grace of God, they didn't say anything, maybe because I was a store manager, but they, God still protected me in that. But I asked him, just take the bottle away from me, and he did. Hmm. Uh, so from March to December, I remember I didn't go out. I just stayed home. I went to work. So on December 31st, uh, I got invited by one of my uh, really good friends, and I hung out with a lot of the gay community because I lived in South Beach. So I went out with some friends that just said, oh, we're just going to go to a restaurant. I know you're doing this new thing where you don't want to go out. We're just going to go to a restaurant. So we ended up going to a restaurant on South Beach. And uh, the crazy part was I was sitting outside, and this guy just comes up out of nowhere just randomly we're sitting outside and he just randomly comes up to us and he is so drunk he's slurring he can't even make out any sentences he's just he's just sat right next to me and i'm thinking wow was that me was that me when i would go out and party because i i don't remember any every if you ask me i don't remember things there's times where i blacked out and I, obviously i asked the lord to show me like god like did anything happen to me while I was blacked out in those times where I don't remember? And I'm seeing him and I'm just like, man, this guy's like, was that me? Of course he left. And then I got home really early, like 1230 in the morning. And I'm just weeping, weeping, weeping. And I'm just like, God, was that how I look to other people? So that night I'm I put on Friends because that was my favorite show because I wanted joy in my life because everything was just darkness. So I put on Friends and I'm just weeping. And the Lord was just like, turn that off, get on your knees and ask me what you want. Literally like in a thunderous but soft voice. And I'm just like, okay. So I get on my knees and I'm like, God, because I didn't know Lord. I said, God, if you can send me someone that's going to love me for me and love me for who I am because I knew my mind was just messed up from what happened to me. I didn't trust anybody. It was just fear and rejection. I didn't really want it to be with anybody. So, But I asked him, if you could send me someone who's going to love me for me and love me for who I am, now I know at that time I didn't know I would commit my life to you. Because I opened my eyes, literally was like, and, you know, I grew up in the hood. So I was like, and God, and if you opt there, <laughs> I said, can you send me someone that's funny 
because these guys in Miami are dry. Like, they don't laugh. They have no joy. Like, it's all about themselves. And I'm tired of it, God. You know, so I'm just saying. You know, so I said that to him. And, you know, obviously, I just went to sleep. And from January to May, May 3rd, I literally... um you know, didn't party still. I was hanging out with my friend. We would have like Bible studies at her house. She would find any, ex- any excuse for me to come to her house, like go hang up a curtain or something. And I'm like, girl, you can't do this by yourself. You live like an hour away. Girl, I got gas money like that. You know, so <laughs> she just find any excuse for me to come to her house so we can have Bible study. May 3rd, 2017, I order an Uber and my phone wasn't working. And I'm just thinking like, why is my phone not working? And so I hit up my ex-boyfriend that I was living with at the time, the guy that I was with for a long time. And I'm like, dude, bro, can you get me a, a Uber? Because I'm not sure what's going on. My phone's not working. So he gets me an Uber and I'm waiting for my Uber and the Uber guy comes up and I open the door and this guy, he's like, you know, says the person's um, name. And I'm like, no, sorry, my friend had to get an Uber for me. And then, but his first thing was, girl, you interrupted my video. And I'm like, excuse me, um, you're supposed to take me wherever I'm supposed to go. Do your job, please. Like, what are you doing? What do you mean I'm interrupting your video? (laughs) You know, so the next literally 10 minutes of the ride to wherever I was going, it was just filled with joy and laughter. I was just overwhelmed that I've never felt so much joy from a person. You know, he told me, before I got out of that ride, he said, God told me that you were going to be my wife. And I'm sitting here like, what? (laughs) I wanted to roll out the car like, hold on, wait a second, while I was moving. I said, bro, I know you didn't just say that to me. I just met you. You know, so he's like, no, God told me that you're going to be my wife. And I'm like, okay, cool. So he's like, we should follow each other on Instagram. And I said, okay, awesome. Right. So (laughs) I went about my business. A week later, he literally reaches out to me. And he's like, hey, because I was going on a job interview and he actually had a um, comedy show the next day that he invited me to and I couldn't go. So he's like, how did your interview go? I said, oh, I didn't get the job or whatever. And how did your competition go? He's like, I didn't win, but whatever. So we started talking and we met up with each other. And literally when we met up with each other, we were like two kids running around in South Beach. Like we've known each other our whole lives. Mm. We started talking and you know, when you like, get to know someone you're like in a car for like hours and you're just talking and getting to know each other and he said to me I have a friend named Jesus you want to you want to get to know uh who I am you got to get to know him and I'm sitting here like okay God like you're really talking to me you, you send my friend to tell me about Jesus and now you're sending this guy to tell me about Jesus the next thing the next thing he said to me he says I see a wall stacked up way out high like a brick wall there's a door um there's a key with my friend jesus and i with his help we're gonna open the door sit on the couch assess the whole situation and one by one that brick wall is gonna come down and i'm sitting here girl from the dmv (laughs) Talk about a wall, a key. What you talking about? You got the access to it? No, no, you don't. So he's just like, I'm being serious. So that was like his first thing that he told me besides about his friend uh, Jesus. And I'm sitting here like, okay. And when he told me that, I just began to just start to think about like, what wall is he talking about? And obviously it's the wall, what happened to me. And little right after that, literally two months later, I'm moving in with this person, okay? (laughs) I'm moving into, uh, we lived in South Beach and we moved to Orlando. I'm moving in with him. And uh, mind you, this is just us. He says that he just got baptized a week before he met me. He's like, skin still wet. I I just came to know the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, here I am. And God's telling me, you're going to be my wife. And I'm just like, wow. So, after that, everything just moved really fast. So from uh, May to literally August, we're moving in with each other. And now between this time of me meeting him, I literally did not know about this whole Jesus thing. I wasn't sure because I remember what happened to me in the Pentecostal church growing up with my dad. So I wasn't really sure. And this is how good God is and how much of a perfect father he is. 
we ended up going to the smallest of churches, like the littlest church in the middle of nowhere in Orlando, Florida, middle of nowhere. It was the like widest church. <laughs> okay. I think we're like the only Hispanic minority people in that church. And this is how much of a gentleman he is because he took me there because he knew that if I was going to go to a church that was like hollering and just, you know, pretty much doing a Jericho dance all around the whole church, I would have been scared. I would have been like, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure about this. But he took me to just like a small, small church. And I went in there. And of course, I was skeptical because, I mean, I went the last time I went to church is when my friend invited me on the Easter Sunday. And I didn't go after that. You know, I just did what I did. But I'm going in there and everybody's like, hi, how are you? And I'm very skeptical because I'm not sure what I'm expecting. But, you know, um, God told this guy that I was going to be his wife. So, I, and, you know, something told me, which now I know the Holy Spirit said, listen to this person. Listen to this guy. So we went to this church. Literally six months from me meeting my husband, I got baptized. I'm literally in the room by myself. It was my husband. Um, back then he was my boyfriend, but he traveled somewhere to New York, I think. And I was in a room listening to worship music. I was watching the Bible series, and the Bible just came alive to me. Although, mind you, from May to when I got baptized, I gave my husband like just hell because I had so many demons. I mean, I'm talking about anxiety, depression. I was suicidal. You know, I just literally, God took the the drink from me, you know, and that's even a story in itself too, because when I try to go drink afterwards, I just spat the drink out. Literally, he removed it from my mouth. I have no desires to even drink anymore. But I gave my husband, I put him through through hell. Like literally, because I was spazzing out on him. It reminds me of the story of Hosea and Gomer, where Hosea would just go and would just come and get her every time. That was me. Like every time I would go against what he would tell me about Jesus and go against what he would tell me about God, I'll just, he'll come back and he would just hug me. He would just tell me, like, it's going to be okay. God loves you. Jesus loves you. You know, so I'm in this room by myself watching the Bible series, listening to worship music. And uh, God says, I want you to get baptized. And I'm like, okay. And I'm ready. Like, it's almost like the scales removed from my eye. And I'm like, I'm ready. I want to get baptized tomorrow. So I called I called my husband and I'm like, babe, I'm ready to get baptized. And he's like, wait, hold on. What do and you at mean? And at this time, just to clarify uh-huh. timeline here, were you guys married already or? No, we were not. Okay. We were literally just dating. Yeah. We moved in together. <laughs> And we were just dating, like, you know, we were new believers. We just, you know, we were figuring just figuring out together. Figuring that yeah. out together. And but every time we got into a fight, my husband will go to the Bible. And he will go to the Bible. He wasn't the person that was like, I'm gonna go get a go to a bar or I'm gonna go get a drink or I'm gonna go to a club or I'm gonna go anything to the world. No, he went to the word. Right. And he came back with the word to me. That day, uh, he came to me and said, I want you to get baptized. This is what the Lord is telling me. I said, okay. And I called my husband. I said, babe, I need to get baptized. So we went to our small little church. And my pastor at the time, he's so awesome. He looked like a hippie, literally. And he, he baptized me. And even before I got baptized, it was hell. Like, we were fighting all day long, like, 12 hours long we fought because the enemy didn't want me to come to the Lord or come to the knowing of God, the true knowing of Jesus. And once I got baptized, literally the scales got removed from my eyes. And I said, okay, we need to get out of this church. No offense to the church we were in, but we were like, we need to get out of this church. We got to go. It's almost like this fire just came upon me. And even after that, so after I got baptized, my husband asked me to marry him on my birthday. And, you know, we got engaged and um, literally six months from there, a year later after we met, we got married. Mm. And the Lord in my dream came to me and said, I need you guys to stop laying next to each other. This is a covenant that I've created for you and I need you to be married. So he came to me again in a dream and with a thunderous voice and said, you need to be married. So I woke up. And within three weeks, he provided everything. He provided my dress. He provided the food. He provided the venue. He was like, you're going to come and you guys are going to get married before me. You're going to create this covenant. And I'm just like, wow, Lord. So 
even itself, that's a testimony. So um, after that, my husband and I now were married. Now we're really understanding uh, the the covenant within God. But of course, even me still, I'm still battling with some things because, you know, what happened to me, it was really hard. Yeah. And I it was hard for me to accept his love. So we came across a scripture in Ephesians where it talks about uh, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, you know, so much that he gave himself up for her. So my husband literally... It brings me back now. Um, he would wash me every time I will fight with him. He will come back with the word and just wash me, literally, and tell me God loves you. Jesus loves you. I love you. He will hug me. We will fight a lot. It was still, even after I got baptized, even after we got married, it was still me not knowing how to receive that love from God. How do I receive this love now from this man that wants to love me? His testimony itself even is a crazy past. So I'm thinking, how do I get this guy that was a liar and a cheater in his past? How is he going to love me? Right. But every time God showed him how to love me, he went to his word and he came back with his word and told me, I love you. God tells me to wash you to take out the spot, to take out the wrinkle. Like, what does that look like? You know, because wrinkles in the spot, they're not easy to get out. So he's just coming back every time and hugging me and loving me. I remember there was even a time where we're on the floor and I'm just crying and he's hugging behind me. And he's like, we're going to get through this. And I started to find, to really see, okay, God really loves me. Jesus really loves me through how my husband was loving me. Every time I would like go into a place where the enemy wanted me to go back and think about what happened to me. Now I don't have the bottle anymore. Now I have to face this. I can't drink my problems away. I got to face this. So he was like a mirror to me, but a mirror in love. Like God just kept showing me, this is how I want to wash you. And this is how I want to love you through your husband. So he would just fight for me every time I will have some like, thoughts of what happened to him he would just fight for me but he'll come back in love he wouldn't come back and like god so you need to do this no he'll come back in love not like condemnation but god wants me to love you right. even when we got married we immediately we became homeless i had uh two miscarriages back to back you know I, we were excited and i was excited to finally have a child to be like wow i'm pregnant even in that moment i was like i'm pregnant you know and I lost my baby. And even in that moment, I said, how did I lose my baby? And, you know, and I started to think to myself, is it because I had all those abortions in my in my younger years, you know? But God is so sovereign. He's so good. He's telling me, he's sending my husband to even love me more. And then even after the second one that I had, the second um, miscarriage, He's so sovereign that he took me to heaven and he allowed me to see my second baby boy <laughs> that I knew that I was going to be a, a boy he allowed me to see him it, it's just such a beautiful dream that I had because he was like a mixture of my husband and I and he was in a place where he was he's better than where we are yeah. he showed me that and he gave me that peace and he healed me through that because most people would say most women would be like why me God why me I can't believe you took my baby away but he literally showed me that he's in a better place both of my kids, that he's in a better place than I was. And while I was in heaven, he showed me my my child, my beautiful baby boy, actually gave me a stone. It was a white stone. And I'm thinking, like, looking at it, like, what is this stone? This is, like, so odd. That's the last thing I remember when, when I woke up. I told my husband, I said, babe, I just saw our little boy. He's about four or five years old in heaven right now. And I'm telling him the story. He's telling me, Oh my God, babe, let me go to the scripture. So he goes to Revelation uh, 2, I believe, where it talks about in back in the day, they will give like a stone to an invitation to a wedding. So here is God telling me like, you're invited to the wedding and the supper of the lamb. And I'm thinking like, this is was a sacrifice that I had to do pretty much give up my children that I always wanted. But I know that he's gracious and I know that he's sovereign, that, you know, he's going to redeem that but yeah. the fact that he healed me even from that from my miscarriages and healed me that it's okay that every child that i aborted is in heaven and they're dancing with the lord you know and mm -hmm. he even gave me that peace within that after that you know my husband we went through more trials 
But, you know, the fact is that my husband loved me through all of it. He continues to wash me with the word. He continues to love me as Christ loves, loves uh, you know, the church. I came across that scripture on how husbands should love their wives. God showed me that any time that I came against, like, if I were to argue or come against the love that my husband was trying to show me, he showed me Jesus and my husband next to each other. And every time I will go against that love, I was pinning, I was pinning Christ back to the cross. Mm. And I kept weeping when I came across that scripture because I said, I love Jesus. You brought joy back into my life. How can I pin you back to the cross? How can I reject the love that my husband's trying to give me? You know, he, when he showed me and convicted me of that, I now then started receiving his love. And I started seeing my worth and I started seeing my value. And I started seeing all the times that God protected me throughout my life. When the car crash, with the whole religions, with the Santeria, like he, pr he protected me from everything. I could have been dead many times, but he, he protected me. So I started to see, wow, like Jesus really loves me. Mm. God really loves me. God says, he really says who he says he is. He really says, I love you, my daughter. You are mine. I called you by name. You are mine. And I'm sitting here like overwhelmed by his love now. I'm not overwhelmed with the sin anymore. I'm overwhelmed and I'm overjoyed with how much God loves me. And I started to see who truly God was and who truly Jesus was through my husband. Wow. Because every time I pushed him away, he came back. And he loved me even more. Hmm. So it was through my husband that I saw who really Jesus was and who God is and how much of a good father he is and how much he loves us. Even six years later, being in the Lord, I'm still going through a process because, you know, it's not till we go before him and we hear those beautiful words, you know, my good and faithful servant, that we are still being washed and cleansed through whatever it is that, you know, we're even going through as believers. Because even if you become a believer, it doesn't stop from you being a target to the enemy. You know, he's going to try to bring back your past. And the Lord is like, listen, I'm trying to show you your future. The enemy wants to show you your past. I want to show you your future. I want to show you his future. You know, he, you know, so it's just so beautiful now that even after six years, the Lord put me even in a pageant just to give me confidence. You know, it was like a Christian small pageant and I got first runner up. I never even thought that I would speak in front of 400 people and share, you know, the, the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. And he even now has me in front of 120 women, 300 women, sharing my testimony of how good he is and how important it is for the husbands to love their wives and wash their wives with the word. And even if you're like, a single woman who doesn't have a husband, you know, get a ring, any ring, I don't know, a plastic ring or metal ring, and just wed yourself to Jesus. And Jesus is going to show you how he's going to show you he's your husband before he actually brings your husband. You know, so I'm, I sit here now in awe of how far he's brought me just talking to women and encouraging them through the word of God and encouraging them that everything that happened to them, like especially sexually abused women or women who've been human trafficked. I spoke in front of women who are human trafficked as well and how Christ can love you. And obviously it's hard for them to believe at that time like it was hard for me, but because God now has given me such peace and grace and the love, right? Because we're called to be the light. They're always ask me, how are you still here? And I'm like, just like you. Because God loves you and Jesus loves you and he wants to wash you and make you clean and take away all the sins. You know, he died on the cross for us and he paid the ultimate price for us. You know, so I'm just happy to say now that I'm able to share my testimony with all women, whether single or, or married or whether you're abused or if you don't have even a dark past and if you've been in the Lord and you grew up in the Lord, like... It's just a true testimony of how God's love would just always, the Bible says, love covers a multitude of sins, multitude, you know? So I know that in the word, it tells us that there's two greatest commandments, love him 
and love each other as I loved you. And what does that look like? You know, because sometimes even in the Lord, your brothers and sisters can get on your nerves, but you know, <laughs> we got to love each other. We're called to do that. So I think it's through sharing my testimony is how I could be the light and I could shine love to others. Yeah. Yeah. Alicia, what was your husband's reaction to sharing with him your past and what you have been through? You know, he was um, very loving because when I shared it with the other guy that I was with for a long time, he was so full of hate, you know. And, and mind you, my husband, there would be like kind of like anger rising up in him. But he just showed me love and he told me that God told him, that's my special daughter and this is how I want you to love her. So his first reaction was just like, okay, this is a lot of weight I'm taking on. But it was, he said, this is the weight that God wants me to bear. So I have to, you know, mm. take the weight now. But he was, he came in love. He wasn't like, what, what's going on? What, who did what? He literally just loved me through it. And his reaction was love. Wow. Yeah. What's your relationship like today with your siblings and with your parents? So I still talk to my brothers and sisters. They don't like the fact that I'm sharing my testimony because in our household, in our whole lives, everything was we need to be quiet. We can't share anything. <laughs> I don't really talk to them that much, but I do pray for them. And I believe that they're going to come to the Lord because I know that there's power in prayer. Yeah. I speak to my twin sister more than the rest of my brothers and sisters. And uh, we actually baptized her like on our 40th birthday. Wow. But you know, since she's around my other brothers and sisters that are not in the Lord, they kind of brought her back. So, I'm, you know, I, I strongly believe that she's the one that's going to come back and then show everybody else, you know, it's just through love that I know that, that they're going to be one over. Yeah. But with my parents, uh, my dad actually, two years, three years ago now, 2020, you know, where everybody was like in inside, where everybody thought they were going to die. <laughs> it's so crazy. I dug deeper into the word. And one day in my prayer, the Holy Spirit said, I need you to call all your brothers and sisters and the last person you're going to call is your dad. And I'm sitting here like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I haven't spoken to my dad in like 20 years. So I said, okay. And I called uh, all of them. And everyone that I hung up on was getting me closer to talk to my dad, right? So when I finally talked to my dad, I just had this like joy and this overwhelming joy and love. And the Holy Spirit has just said, just say, I forgive you. And as soon as I heard his voice, and I haven't heard it in a long time, he heard mine and he automatically automatically called my name out. Uh, you know, in the Latin culture, they call you by your middle name. So he called my middle name. And then I'm like, oh, hi, dad. And I told him, I said, I just want to let you know that I came to the knowing of Jesus. And I want to forgive you for everything that you did and that I love you. And that in the Bible, it talks about you returning back to your first love. And I know that you grew up in a church and I know that you got to know Jesus in that time and God's calling you back to him. Oh. So my dad broke out crying. Mind you, I never heard my dad cry. He's like this really macho man. I've never heard him cry. He says, I'm sorry I did those things to you. I'm sorry I led you to drugs. I'm sorry I led you to alcohol. I'm sorry I led you to a life that you shouldn't have lived. And I'm sitting here like listening to this, but I have such peace because I want to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is telling me, <laughs> you know, but I didn't realize till way later where I was just like, wow, God just healed me from my dad. And, you know, forgiveness is such a powerful thing. Literally, like, I was not expecting that. And I, I went from having such fear of my dad and thinking things of my dad, like, my dad's never going to listen to me. He's never going to be happy that I'm sharing this. To me now saying, I forgive you hmm. and that I love you and that Jesus loves you. And he wants you to come back to him. And he's, like, begging me, telling me, call the rest of your sisters. Please tell them that you came to the Lord. And I said, I was like, Dad, I can only do my part. But if you come back to Christ, and I read scriptures with him, I prayed with him, oh. and I said, if you come back to Christ, Christ is going to move in your life so much, then, then you'll see. You have to do that. I can't do that for you. 
But that call was just so beautiful. And it's again, it goes back to the love of the Father and the love of God and how He really restores everything that the enemy stole from you. And I'm thinking, well, my dad's not going to listen to me. He probably doesn't want to talk to me. But as soon as I got to him, it was just such a, I had this authority and it's like the Holy Spirit just filled that room and the call went really well. And now I have the weight off of me Mm. where now I forgave my dad. And, you know, he just keeps peeling back the layers of everything of what happened to me in my life. So I'm free from that now. And, you know, if my dad was standing here, I would freely talk to him i wouldn't be scared of him no more like i was i would mm. love on him you know what i mean because the bible tells us god tells us he wants none of his children to perish so i pray for my dad daily and i pray that he comes to the knowing of jesus and the true love of of god and the true love of a father so it was beautiful but my relationship with him now is even a far away because i feel like he still holds on to holds on to the shame of what he did you know, it wasn't just us. It was other kids. My mom used to have a, a daycare, and he also did that to other kids as well. He actually told us to do it to other kids. So, my, you know, my dad, I think he holds on to everything that he did. So he really doesn't. He's like when I had shame. He mm-hmm. doesn't want to come to facing what happened. But I will sit here, and I will talk to him and pray for him. <laughs> you come know? On. So, yeah. Alicia, who is Jesus to you? He is my husband he brought back joy into my life um when i say he brought back the joy because i remember before i was five before that happened to me i was just a kid that ran around in guatemala and just laid on the tile floor to cool off because it was so hot and i remember that joy but obviously that joy was taken away from me but he's my joy he's my redeemer my restorer he's my best friend and but mainly He's my husband. Yes. Now, Alicia, for people who have gone through that similar abuse as a child, and maybe they haven't shared it with anybody and uh, they're living in that shame, or maybe they just don't even want to talk about it. It's just kind of shelved. What's a word of encouragement that you can give to that person that's watching right now? I would just uh, pray out to God, just say a simple prayer like I did. I literally just said, God, if you're up there, if you're real, show yourself to me, and he will show himself to you. And he will show you how to take away that pain. You have that shame that you're carrying. He wants to take it off of you. You know, he says, come to those who are heavy laden and heavy burden, I will give you rest. He wants to give you rest. Because all those thoughts that you've been fighting with and all that shame that you've had, he wants to give you rest from that. Just say a simple prayer. That's all it took for me. God doesn't want you to be like, oh, I have to be clean and I have to be cleansed and I got to do right before I come to him. No, he wants you to just come to him like a child and just lay it out for him. He wants to just love on you and protect you. So my word of encouragement to you would just to just to pray call out to him. And then like the Bible says, he'll show you things unknown. And that thing that he showed me that was unknown was love because I didn't know about love until I met him. I didn't know how to be loved or feel loved or receive love until I met him. Mm. Alicia, for the people who have done things that your father has done, um, and maybe they're living in that shame and don't know what to do and they just think about the past and what they have done from a person who has experienced um, that pain what can you tell that that man that woman who maybe has taken advantage of another child uh you know the bible tells us to confess our sins to one another so that we shall be healed one of the things that really got me to be out of my shame and out of my pain is constantly talking about what happened to me, confessing what happened to me. And I know that could be hard because, you know, you're like, confess. What if I confess, then people are going to condemn me. But the Bible says that if you're in Christ, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So if you receive him, you receive him in your heart, 
And I know that may be easier said than done, but it's like I said, if you call out to him and if you just pray, he would truly show you things and he would truly show you how to to love and how to forgive and go to those people because he doesn't want you to carry that shame. He really just wants you to confess so that way he can turn your stony heart into a heart of flesh because he just wants love to flow through it. Mm. And I know that it could be, it's not an easy thing to do what you did. Trust me, I, because of what happened to me, I also did that as a child. I also touched other children because I was four, so I had that weight on me. But once I started confessing it and I started sharing it, even if you just share it to God, or even if you share it to a person that you trust, you know, it, but I would mainly share it to the Lord. I would share it to God, just say a small prayer and confess it because God says he wants us to confess it. And once you confess it, you'll see how that weight will come off of you and how much you'll free you feel versus shame. Mm. So, yeah. Alicia, any last words for people who are watching your testimony right now? Yes. Uh, to the women who are married and who have a husband that seeks the Lord every day, you know, the Bible tells us as wives, so to, so wives submit to your husbands in reverence to the Lord. You know, just submit. And uh, he also tells us that we should have a meek, gentle spirit about us. So when you dig deeper into the word and find out who God calls you to be as a woman, he's going to show you how to submit. Or even to those women that the husbands are not really seeking the Lord. Again, First Peter 3 tells us that meek, gentle spirit will win your husband, may win your husbands over. Hmm. Or even to the single women, which is really important for me because I was a single person for a long time without the Lord. Just get any ring a uh, rubber ring, get it on Amazon, and just wed yourself to Christ. You know, the Bible tells us that he wants us to just be, you know, he's our husband, he's our main husband. And then just find true love in him and trust in him. And those women who've been abused, like myself, just know that all it takes is just a small prayer and just a little bit of your heart. The Bible says he's just a faith as small as a mustard seed. That's all he wants from us. It's just faith in our hearts. So... Just to give you that words of encouragement, just reach out to him. Like I keep saying, I'm telling you, the the scripture that keeps standing out, it says, call out to me and I'll show you things unknown. And he will show you that love that you've been missing or that um, anything that you feel like you've been missing in your life, he will give it to you and he will fulfill it. Amen. So, yeah. Alicia, could you please pray for the people who are watching on the other side of the screen and are receiving what you're saying right now or maybe are identifying with some of the same things that you've experienced in your life? Yes, of course. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Father God. We thank you that you are the creator. We thank you that you uh, just created the person that's on the other side of the screen, Lord Father God. But the word says that you've counted and you know how many hairs we have on top of our heads, Lord Father God. You said that you fearfully and wonderfully made us, Lord Father God. You said, great out your work. So we thank you, Father, for creating us, Lord Father God. We thank you that you gave us life. Father, I know that the person is that's on the other side of the screen is going through shame or going through uh, depression or anxiety or fear or of not wanting to confess of what they did or or anything that, that they feel like, well, God is not going to receive me because I did this. Lord Father God, I pray and I encourage that they confess their sins so that it could be healed, so that their heart will be open, so you can flow through it, Lord Father God. I pray that the words that the Holy Spirit wanted me to say today, I pray that it touches their heart, Lord Father God, and I pray that it is love, not anger or not fear, Father Lord God. But I mostly thank you that whoever is watching this, Lord Father God, is that you created them and that you created them for a purpose. You created them for a reason, for such a time as this, Lord Father God, to hear this testimony, my testimony, your story, Lord Father God. So I thank you. I thank you to those who who are creating their testimony right now, Lord Father God. And, and when they come to the knowing of who you are, that they're just going to shout out and, and just in love of who you are and in awe of who you are, Father. But I pray for that person that it just takes a small prayer to call out to you, Lord. Just call out to the name of Jesus and he will show up in your room or wherever you are. 
But I thank you mostly that you created them and that you love them and all you want to do is just love them. But it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.